Polish pronunciation of the name, the French would say Banatak. So that's another cultural issue, how you do pronunciation. And they're inspired us, not partners. <laughs> so welcome, Olivier. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to, to present you uh, and to tell you the, the, the quickly the story of the GIS in, uh, in Strasbourg. And uh, as you will see, this will lead us to uh, the future and uh, our project, uh, current project, and uh, what we plan to, to develop. Finally, I will share with you our vision of uh, GIS uh, in uh, municipalities and uh, the, the connections with uh, the scope of INSPIRE. A few words about Strasbourg. Strasbourg, as you may know, is uh, located uh, both in a cross uh, in a crossroad uh, central position and a cross border position, um, and uh, the territory uh, is a merging point of German and uh, French culture due to historical reasons. Uh, the Euro, Euro metropolis uh, is. Uh, 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 gathering of uh, 33 municipalities, uh, occupying a territory of uh, 340 square kilometers and a population of uh, almost 500,000 inhabitants. The president is Mr. Robert Herrmann. Some of you may have seen him uh, introducing uh, and welcoming everybody yesterday. So our history as a GIS starts in the, at, the, at the end of the 18th century. That's uh, quite weird. Uh, when the, the Land Survey Department was created in order to, to set a new German cadastre, uh, this has been occupying us and uh, we have been maintaining this new cadastre during all the 20th century uh, with a particularity which is that uh, all the graphical elements of this cadastre, as you've seen, you, you may see on the, the illustration, uh, can be calculated in coordinates. It's not only a graphical document. And uh, in, the, in the middle of the, um, the 20th century, we started uh, making uh, land survey maps as well as the cadastral map. And uh, this uh, land survey map have been extended at the end of the 20th century to cover the recently created urban community of Strasbourg, which became later on the Euro-Metropolis. On the illustration here, you can see a sample, our topographic data. Therefore, when uh, we started to our GIS project at the end of the 20th century, uh, all these, uh, these maps, these background maps, cadastre and topographic were digitized uh, and uh, these reference data were uh, completed with uh, aerial photography in order to, to, have, to set the basis for a technical GIS that started to be widely used among all the depart technical departments of the collectivity. Uh, on, on this slide, you can see, um, you can see uh, on the left-hand side uh, the, our topographic data, reference data, and on the right-hand side, the, the use uh, that is made uh, by um, all our data networks, uh, networks uh, management uh, departments. Uh, you can see the, the interest and the necessity of sharing uh, among all the departments the same topographic very highly precise and detailed information in order to be able to position correctly and precisely all the networks. Uh, I give you a few figures uh, on the slide. In its uh, evolution process, our GIS has, uh, has evolved to uh, not only a technical management of the territory tool, but also decision-making tool. And we started uh, first to use uh, socioeconomic data indicators, you know, statistical units, population indicators, uh, in order to, to provide uh, decision-making uh, information and maps to the, uh, the politics. But also, uh, we, we are in a, in a process where we, s we want to, to make decision-making indicators from uh, technical uh, data. 
on this uh, on this illustration you can see uh, uh, data that are used and maintained uh, by the road maintenance uh, departments uh, these data are relative to uh, the, um, the road marks and uh, this precise data useful for uh, maintaining the road marks can be generalized aggregated in uh, statistical units in order to see how the uh, how the, the road maintenance is uh, handled in the different municipalities. This is only an example, but uh, this example can be generalized to all the technical data. Uh, nowadays, we have two main projects, uh, the first of, uh, of which uh, started uh, at the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, which is uh, modeling uh, the city in 3D and uh, setting the GIS to, uh, to, um, to become a 3D GIS. So at this, uh, uh, the second project is uh, related to taking time into account. And uh, I, will, uh, I will now switch to a small video that will present you uh, our vision and uh, our users of uh, this, uh, these two uh, projects. Okay, I'm sorry the title is in French. So we are going to start uh, by a historical visit uh, to some area in Strasbourg. As you may see, we start uh, at the middle of the 18th century and uh, we are going to see uh, the, 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 the area changing as the year passes. Uh, as you may notice, the territory uh, becomes more and more complex, more and more, more, and more urbanized, and uh, the level of, the, uh, of detail of the documentation grows as well as uh, more and more detailed. Then, uh, as you have seen the, on the last uh, image, we were in 2018, that is to say in the future, uh, and we are, we are coming uh, now to a 3D vision of the territory. This vision uh, is an auto image, uh, 3D photo image that was uh, realized in uh, 2013, and it gives us a, a very uh, an extraordinary uh, source of information for many purposes. Uh, I think that uh, we can consider now that uh, uh, aerial photography is evolving from 2D to 3D. And now we have passed from uh, uh, 3D photo mesh to uh, point cloud. Uh, 3D point cloud obtained by uh, airborne LIDAR, laser, uh, which has a, a very dense uh, level of detail to 20, 20 points by, by square meters. As you have seen, uh, this is very useful for technical uh, uh, uses, but also for uh, many uh, other purposes, like environmental studies. And uh, these two uh, non-interpreted uh, data uh, have uh, um, a name, which is to uh, be able to manage a 3D semantic model that you can see here. Uh, this semantic model gives us a vision of uh, uh, both uh, the, the, uh, the current situation of the territory, but also the, the capacity to represent project. And here you can see uh, the area how, as it will be uh, in, uh, in one year. All the, um, all the equipments you can see on the image are coming from the GIS, the trees, the, the, light, the lights, and uh, the bus stops. All this is very precise with a precision, precision of five centimeters. So um, this explains what we are intending to do in Strasbourg. That is to say, having a, a GIS that will uh, enable us to have the best uh, knowledge of the territory as possible in all its dimensions, uh, past, present, future, but also 3D. Uh, I am now... Um, I will now switch back to the presentation and conclude. No. Okay. Sorry. 
So, as a conclusion, we have a, a very rich uh, GIS, which has been, uh, uh, for historical reasons, which has been widely used uh, during uh, many years by all the technical departments of the, of the, of the, um, of the city, of the municipality, and the, the collectivity. And uh, we have a lot of project of uh, evolution. Uh, these projects and all these data are leading uh, us to, to new technology, drones, mobile mapping, um, and uh, there is a, an issue for, uh, for Inspire because we have uh, already uh, set some data sets in uh, open data, uh, but we still need to have our proper SDI. For the moment, we are using the, the region SDI, but we don't have any SDI for, uh, for Strasbourg. So all the, the data I have shown you in a, for the 3D data, for example, uh, is not uh, broadcasted for, for the moment. Uh, this is an issue for us. Generally speaking, uh, all our work leads us to a questioning about Inspire because uh, the, we are making the, the constat that uh, uh, the specification were, were uh, conceived in uh, 2007, when uh, in a in a period when uh, uh, many of the, the the data I've shown you didn't exist or were still experimental, so uh, will Inspire take all these new types of data into account, like photo meshes or point clouds, and uh, and and also time, uh, because uh, the the time di dimension, temporal dimension, is very very important. And uh, at the, in the actual, in the current state of Inspire, of the specification, we don't have any, uh, any time dimension. I've finished. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Olivier, for providing us with another impression of Strasbourg. Are there questions in the audience? Yes, please use the microphone. I've got a loud voice as well. Okay, it's from the uh, okay. So, uh, um, can you give us an idea of the of the cost of your project to create the three D um, semantic model? Um, it's difficult. It's difficult because um, uh, it depends if you want to, if you're talking about a global cost including all the, the time spent uh, by uh, engineers and technicians uh, in order to, to get this result, or if you just uh, uh, mean uh, the, the cost of the data acquisition. Uh, the global cost. Uh, I, I, won't, I am not able to give you uh, a precise uh, figure, but uh, if I had to estimate it, I would estimate it to some uh, 3,000, uh, uh, 300,000 euros. Hello. Is it well used by the private sector? For the moment, it's not available for the private sector, this 3D model. Uh, that's, uh, that's, one, uh, that's why I was saying that uh, we are, uh, we are uh, willing to put it in open data, as the rest of the data that we have already set in open data. If there are no more questions, thank you again, and we enjoy very much to stay in your city. Thank you. Yes, thank you. No. Just a moment. Yeah. Thank you again. Yes, my name is Matthias Schröder. I'm from the Senat Department of Berlin, and uh, we're thinking about an integrative management approach of subsurface data for major cities, major cities like Berlin. 
the private sector, no, the public sector uh, made efforts in the last decade uh, to establish spatial data infrastructures in Germany. They growing at all levels, GDIDE and the state SDIs. And since 2004, Berlin is addressing SDIs in a cross-administrative fashion from all these senats. And uh, this is according to the inspired schedule with metadata, download transformation, data service, and so on. And this have been implemented there. We see here some uh, examples. And uh, due to these activities, there are assets arisen, or they have arisen, uh, also in the uh, state geology of Berlin, the uh, geological survey of Berlin. Um, this is our group, or my working group, and uh, we are subdivided in a part of geology, hydrogeology, and geoinformation. And as you can see here, we have uh, millions of drilling wells, no, not millions, uh, 160,000, around about. And uh, the, the drilling wells are the basis for the ge geological 3D model. And we have diverse digital maps and web services and so on. Uh, web service for geothermal potential, geological maps, and, and, and many more. And in the hydrogeology, we have a state groundwater monitoring network. And uh, we uh, modelize or modeling uh, digital groundwater maps and uh, groundwater model. And uh, on the other part, the geoinformation part, this is my part. Uh, we make, in general, the management for this geodata, web mapping, and so on workflow optimization, and also the data preparation for the INSPIRE workflow, or INSPIRE uh, directive. And um, all these um, activities in our group and in the Senate as well uh, are accompanied, accompanied uh, by the um, e-government process in Berlin. We had, we had uh, different initiatives there, the Smart City Initiative and so on. And uh, recently it, uh, it is implemented in the e-government uh, act of Berlin. Uh, recently means uh, last year. And since this uh, e-gov act is there, it fosters our public partic participation uh, in the administrative processes and it, it, and it, it, it improves um, our access to data and information for the public, for the uh, commercial sector, and so on. And it, it has already modified and improved many planning processes. But there is also an almost untouched um, topic, and this is the subsurface management. And we want to change this, or we want to improve this. Uh, in brief, a small vision of our subsurface management in a nutshell. There is a progressive urbanization uh, and it, urbanization in Berlin and other cities, and it just, uh, causes pressure on space and uh, resources, and also on the development of the subsurface. And uh, subsurface data are necessary for long-term planning in world cities, as, as in Berlin too, and the understanding of, of the sub subsurface beneath our cities are a key focus for modern geological surveys, we think. And we need a better management, and uh, this means we need um, better tools, uh, better databases, uh, um, a monitoring network, which uh, allows us to ingest the data automate in, in an automatic way, and so on. OK, and to describe this, uh, subsurface data management a little bit closer, we identified uh, different challenges. And um, the intensified usage of the subsurface is uh, of increasing for economic, societal, and scientific interests. And it needs to consider conflicting types of uh, the use. There are tunnel constructions and plannings and supply networks, groundwater protection, Maybe in future comes hyperloop tubes or something like that. And uh, this 
further increase the relevance due to unsolved and unaddressed questions like uh, missing data, data acquisitions, and uh, uh, yeah, tools. And the approach to these challenges is uh, we call it integrated subsurface management, as, and this could be a basis for a comprehensive uh, database, or it needs comprehensive databases. It needs higher resolution 3D models and uh, process, a new processing model and monitoring networks with, uh, with sensor observations. And how could this work? This is um, yeah, a more um, theoretical uh, approach now, but it must be um, integrate the exploration planning yeah, the exploration and the planning uh, phase. It must be integrated in operation of monitoring networks, and that all uh, is for the preservation of the subsurface because there is also a, um, a target or a, a task to, to save the subsurface. Um, and this is based on the IT infrastructure, on the good IT infrastructure, which is already done. So let me come to this slide. How could this approach look like? Um, this is the main slide of my, of my presentation, and it looks a little bit uh, difficult, and let me explain this a little bit more. We have the supply side down, and uh, there are we talking about, uh, about service platforms and data these uh, web services and the service platform and data are already done. There's a lot of work have been done in the last years. We, ha we have uh, reference architectures like the Inspire architecture is. And uh, this is what we, have, what we have so far. Yeah, But we have the other side, the demand side, and we can, just, we can talk not about just um, developing software and developing new two tools. That is a complex um, framework with uh, a depend de dependencies of many factors. Yeah? We need, for, ex for instance, new policies. We, need, uh, we have to adapt the policies which are exists now. The, we have to adapt these policies to um, more digital, digital business processes. And what we need also are better 3D models and simulations. Yeah? This models, the models and the simulations are key factors for, for this approach. And then we can develop new applications, and this all will cause costs and time. And uh, it is not, um, it is not uh, to do with a, with a short time period. We think uh, we need a little bit more time to implement such a integrated subsurface data management. I wanted to show the complexity with this uh, slide. So let us come back to Berlin. Uh, we identified some or few uh, use cases which can be developed to new business processes. Uh, the groundwater monitoring, we have over 1,000 groundwater monitoring wells. There are few challenges. challenges. Uh, we got uh, a manual data import uh, as, uh, at the moment. There are just a uh, few, um, let me say 100 or something like that, uh, monitoring wells which, which uh, send their data automatically, and the other, um, the other monitoring wells will be uh, uh, read out uh, by hand. And the data yeah, the data is also manually exchanged with stakeholders, with, for instance, the water companies. And what we need is uh, a sensor integration to get automated data transmissions from all wells. Uh, we need an automated publishing of data and, and data exchange with the stakeholders, and also automated reports, e-reports, for the water and construction companies. That is one use case. And the na another use case is the further or our extended development for geological models. And we have, as I said before, one, round about 160,000 boreholes. 
and there will add it around about thousand boreholes or drilling wells uh, each year again uh, added. Uh, and the, sh the challenge here is this manual data import into database, uh, and the data are used for construct geological maps, for cross sections, and also for the three 3D modeling. And we need an automated data import uh, to update these procedures. And also the semantically linkage uh, between all these data assets to simplify the data product generation. And the third and last uh, use case for, for this presentation is the geothermal exploitation. We have uh, information on data for over three, 13,000 uh, wells with this respective thermal conductiv conductivity potential. And the data are used for planning and the approval uh, for uh, geothermal plants. And the challenge here is uh, just we have only a near surface geothermal energy extraction in Berlin. And the deep, uh, the deep surface is uh, not allowed in Berlin because we have uh, the groundwater uh, level behind Berlin and uh, we uh, get our fresh water from these groundwater levels. And uh, what we need here is to uh, modernize and, uh, and make a part or quite of semi-automated approval procedure for this private and commercial geothermal systems. And all of these together, uh, we want to modernize our workflows, we want to improve the databases and uh, we want to uh, bring us together to a real integrated data management process. So, and we're seeking for collaborations and partners. There are a lot of uh, initiatives and uh, uh, in the national and international geological service like in the BGR or the BGS or BRGM uh, they make or they they, uh, they make uh, smart things there, and also s industry stakeholders are interesting for us. For instance, the Deutsche Bahn, because if they plan new uh, lanes or traces uh, uh, due to Berlin, uh, they need uh, the geological information from us, and we think we can uh, develop with the Deutsche Bahn new business processes to 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 build up uh, or to make special workflows for, for this. Also the standardization consortium uh, like the OGC underground group is important or interesting for us and also academic projects like the uh, uh, coast project. Is somebody here from the coast project or is somebody related with the coast project? Yes, okay, maybe we can talk about this. Yes, and uh, let me con uh, summarize this. Uh, Berlin has uh, successfully set up its SDI, and we think it is time for uh, a subsurface management, a new subsurface management. And this is a complex task in a complex context. And based at these identified scenarios, initial apl applications could be realized at the moment. And we think that is, uh, we are at a starting phase now, um, but we are Berlin, we got the data, and uh, we're looking for partners, partners, and let us start to be, go digital in, this, in the subsurface. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Matthias Schröder. Are there questions? Please just wait for the microphone because of the recording. Thank you. Hello. Uh, first, uh, short question. The data of the SDI about groundwater, groundwater and so on are public or closed only for internal use? Um, thank you for the questions. In general, the uh, data are uh, public. Yeah. So uh, we have the open data initiative yeah. also in Berlin. All our data data are uh, uh, in public access, yes. But uh, let me say, uh, this data which we give to the public 
is a little bit uh, uh, smaller with this metadata uh, describing than this data we use in our department, yes. But in general, it is public, yes. Okay. Only a second mm. little question. Uh, have you think about security of the data? Because I think groundwater, drink water, is a critical infrastructure. Yeah, that's true. And uh, if you put uh, drilling holes and so mm. on mm. Uh, in the open data, I mm. think, uh, mm. yeah, in yeah. your project plan, you have it in mind? or. Mm. Mm. Yeah, this is this is difficult, uh, and we have to discuss about it. But this is what I mentioned before. Um, we we give our data to the public. There is a public access, but just uh, there are also, or especially uh, for for instance, for this borehole data, there are a lot of data or borehole data which are not public. Yeah, they are maybe just uh, too deep. Yeah, yeah, maybe like this, yeah. And uh, we have uh, more metadata on it, and there was be decided, okay, this uh, stays in our department, but the, uh, the location and so on, this goes out, yeah. Thank you. Uh, you said that you want to build up a real 3D uh, infrastructure. Yeah. This is does this imply that you want to set up a 3D geological model of the subsurface of Berlin, a, 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 a real model? Yeah, yeah. So we, we, we got a model. Let me go back. Just a small picture of it. You see it here on the left side? Yeah, how did you do this? Oh, a long way. <laughs> <laughs> this is a long way. But let me explain. Uh, we got this 3D model now, but it is uh, in a kind of static uh, uh, stand uh, state. It can't update it. It, it can't update it. Oh, because, yeah. And this is our problem. We want to uh, improve this model with uh, new information from the new drilling wells. And at the moment, we have no workflow to do this. And we want to change this because uh, it, it would be nicer uh, if you got uh, new information from the drilling wells per year, 1,000, and then you can improve your 3D model, yes? And uh, this has to be developed, yeah. Okay. Slightly off topic from uh, the geology side, but have you got any plans of bringing in underground apparatus from private companies and do you think that's going to be easy to get into your public models? So I, yeah, this is a good question. I don't know. Let me say, uh, so I talk now for our department, and um, we uh, present or we uh, give our data to, uh, or make it open, yes? Make it open for the commercial side and make it open for uh, interested public, yes? Um, but uh, at the moment, we have no uh, uh, no uh, agreement or uh, idea how to uh, invite this uh, commercial sector then. Uh, but we work on it. Let's think about it. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. does the federal government, while other states do not provide open data, they even say never ever. So there was quite a discussion in Germany, even there can be a struggle, and why we have a discuss in Germany, we get overtaken as a left flank by countries like Netherlands and like Denmark. That leads to the next presentation by Frederica Bellabronca from the Boston University of Technology. And she is going to present on um, open data and the challenge that puts on the business models for national mapping agencies. Welcome. Thank you. Actually, just to go back to your problem with geological survey data, in the Netherlands it has been available as open data for a long time, but it's not been used very much. And that's available in 3D models as well. But that's beside the point. Um, 
I'm Frederica Welledonker. I'm from Delft University of Technology, Knowledge Center Open Data. Um, and I'm doing this research together with the people from EURSDR, so I'll explain to you later. Um, quick overview. I'll give you first an introduction to our Knowledge Center and to EURSDR, and then I'll talk a little bit about the previous research we've done on business models for self-funding agencies. Uh, I'll talk about the current research we're doing, the outcomes of the survey we held, and the next steps. Um, as I said, we're Knowledge Center Open Data. We research all the governance and non-technical aspects of open data. Um, we leave the technical aspects to people who know a lot more about technique than we do. We concentrate, as I said, on governance, on legal issues, economic issues, organizational issues. Um, we have lots of publications all available as open data, so should you be interested, please visit our website. EuroSDR, it's a Euro pan-European network of mapping agencies and academia working together. They have been going for quite a while, but in the past under a different name. And it's a not-for-profit not organization. <coughs> its basis is at the KU, the uh, Catholic University in Leuven. Um, and as I said, there's research projects in the past. They've looked at topics like crowdsourcing and national mapping or at city GML. Uh, currently, there's four Oh, pardon me, there's a number of, of uh, research projects going. Um, the economic value of 3D geo-information, I believe there's a workshop on it at the end of um, this month in Amsterdam, should people be interested. Uh, Roger Longhorn has just received an extension, I believe, to this project. Uh, the last three projects I know nothing about. I'm in the third project, together with my colleague from the uh, from the Knowledge Center, Bastian van Loene, and with Joop Comforts from uh, KU Leuven, Catholic University in Leuven. Um, aim of the business modeling data. As I said, Euro SDR, there's mapping agencies, are partners in Euro SDR, and the national mapping and cadastral agencies. In Europe, most of them are self-funding agencies, which means that they are responsible to generate sufficient income to cover a substantial part of their operating costs. Uh, which means that if they're gonna do open data, and a lot of them are under an increasing pressure to do so, they're going to lose revenue, especially in the short term. And that's gonna pose a risk for them to maintain the data because if they receive less income they have less money to spend on doing what they're supposed to do and that's maintain high value high quality data um, the other problem also is that they will become more dependent on the political will to cover a part of their operating cost uh, because then they go back into the situation where they are they depend on the, the will of the budget every year to see whether they get sufficient funding. And this sounds a little bit like a joke, but it's not. In the Netherlands, the Dutch cadastre nearly went bankrupt in the 90s because their funding was being cut and cut and cut and cut and cut until they had no money left at all to even keep the lights on burning. So it is an issue. Um, so our research question for this research was, how can we assess the, the real effects of open data policies on the policy model? So we're now not talking about theory because there's lots and lots of reports written on the theory of the effects of open data, but now we actually want to measure it and we want to measure it among national mapping and cadastral agencies in this case. So we're taking a small subset, but we're specifically interested to see how they can refinance their operating costs to ensure the long-term sustainability of open data. Uh, just a quick recap as to why open data, because it's uh, quite a lot of, of legislation. Um, countries may have a key register system. The Netherlands has one, Denmark has one, and uh, from what I've been hearing around here, a couple of other countries either already also have one or they're in the process of setting one up. And that just means that there is only one 
data set, main data set holder responsible for one key register or a base register or whatever you want to call it, other government agencies have to reuse that data set. And it's really about efficiency and it's also about making sure that data remains authentic because if every organization is maintaining their own little database, at some stage you just don't know which one is the truth anymore because they all have different update rates and use different names, etc. Inspire, I don't have to tell you about Inspire, you all know more about Inspire than I do. In 2010, we had the digital agenda for Europe, um, and it actually re-emphasized this, this single market to generate more money from data, uh, but what it also did, it was the input for a lot of open data policies in Europe. Uh, they used the digital agenda as a starting point, and it was also um, in one of the parts of the digital agenda was that the public sector information reuse directive of 2003 <coughs> was amended. It was reviewed and it was amended and a new directive came into force in 2013. In 2013, uh, the PSI directive doesn't actually say that government organization should supply open data. It just lets you say it very strongly recommends they do so. They do make an exception for self-funding agencies though. Uh, they are in a special regime. They are still allowed to charge a co um, dissemination costs for the data, but if they do so, they have to provide uh, in a transparent way the way how they calculated the, uh, the fees that they charge. Um, so there is more pressure on them. When the uh, PSI reuse directive was implemented into Dutch law. There were three organizations named in the act who were exempt from the act. And I'll talk to you about them later on. Um, we've also, round about the same time, also in July 2013, the G8 Open Data Charter was adopted. That's really more about government transparency and accountability. And so it includes a lot more than just geographical data. It does give all the open data principles by default. It also states that op government data should be open data by default unless, and unless is for privacy reasons or whatever. Um, and a part of the G8 open data charter was that countries who adopted the charter had to um, also uh, develop a national action plan and one of the things that had to be in it was how they plan to release high value data. And geographical data, cadastral data, mapping data is part of those high value data sets. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of pressure on national mapping agencies to start supplying open data. Apart from the fact that there's also a lot of pressure from society and companies, but also political pressure. If you start talking about cost recovery policies versus open data, very simplified, government sometimes finances a public sector organization to some extent. They provide licensed data to users, users pay, pay license fees, the users use the products. This is theory, by the way. And the users reuse the data to make fancy information products to other users. And while they're doing it, they also generate taxation in the form of income tax or value added taxes, et cetera, and that should flow back to the government again. And the idea is that the government that's on the right hand side of the graph will actually use that same money to refinance the public sector body second to the left. In practice, that doesn't always happen. Um, if you go to open data, you'll see that a public sector organization provides open data but doesn't actually get anything back from the user. So it becomes very reliant on government for continuous funding. Um, as I said, this is theory. In practice, though, public sector organizations quite often have some other means of generating income. They have legal instruments to their availability. For instance, they can charge registration fees for the registers. Every time you register a car, you have to pay a fee, or every time you have a, a real estate transaction, you have to pay the cadastre. Uh, so they can charge, they have legal instruments available for registration fees. 
They can also act as a service provider for other organizations, smaller public sector organizations or municipalities who are too small to do their own service provision. So another company, another organization can do it on their behalf. And what you also see, especially in the Netherlands, is they can also act as a data platform host. So they run the national data portal. Uh, and they can also get money for that. Definition business models, because sometimes there's a bit of confusion between business models and business cases. This is the definition that Euro SDR adheres for business models. It is very descriptive. I find it unworkable because I'm a little bit dyslectic and I hook off after the second sentence. Uh, that's just a problem I have. So I find this a much simpler version. Um, but what you should bear in mind that the business model is more than just money. It's also the, the strategies you employ, what <coughs> products do you have on offer, what value does, does it offer to potential users, how are you go going to organize to disseminate it to people, which technology are you going to use, which alliances are you going to forge to disseminate this, this uh, information, and one part of it is how you're going to finance it. So it is broader than just money. Um, we did some previous research uh, in, on business models for self-funding agencies and we looked at roles and activities within the information value chain. This is a very simplified version of the information value chain because there's m many more steps into it, but just for, for graphic sake, we simplified it. And what we found is that sort of at the start of the chain, you have the data providers, and as you move down the chain, they start adding more value to the chain. So the aggregators are already adding value to the chain by aggregating data sets from various providers. Um, they can also provide tools for making the data more user-friendly. Um, they can also use their knowledge, their specific knowledge, to provide advice or specific products, consultancy services. And they become more and more an enabler of data rather than just a provider of data. Um, then also you have enrichers. There are quite often uh, companies that use open data to enrich their own business processes. Um, Esri is a very good example of a company like that. Uh, you have also developers, and uh, quite often they're not part of the, the, the open data ecosystem itself, but they make products on demand, or sometimes they use it as a sort of a calling card to say, you know, this is what I can do, please hire me to do more. Um, yeah, and they all go and tap into the end user, and the end user, of course, can become the input for the next value chain because he, he or she then be becomes the starting point. What we found when we did the case study research in 2015, 2016, we looked at six organizations. Five of them were self-funding organizations, agencies. Uh, one of them was funded, wholly funded by the government. Five of these organizations provide open data or were just about to start to provide open data. One did not and is not and has no intention to do so. Just a little guess. Which organization do you think does not provide open data? Exactly. The one that is still on the data aggregation level because there is no incentive to them to provide tools to make the data more user-friendly. As a matter of fact, they are hugging their data so much that no one can develop tools. Uh, so the, the Dutch Chamber of Commerce, the holder of the, the trade registered data, they are such data huggers that they, um, it's not going to be open data. The cadaster is a self-funding agency. They were under a lot of pressure to supply open data. They resisted for a very long time, but once they made the move to open data, they went one step further and they're really moving down, even almost towards the enriched phase now. Uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics is the only organization that 
is not a self-funding agency, but when they started supplying open data, they found they got so many demands for value-added products, consultancy services, they're actually now making more money out of consultancy services than they were before they were selling the data. So even though it was not a choice to provide value-added services, because that's not their core business, and they don't really want to do it, they are doing it by default because the market is not doing it. Interesting case. Um, for this project, we did an online survey of national mapping and cadastral agencies in, in April, and we asked them a number of questions. You know, when did you start open data? How is the funding arranged before and after open data? How do you fund open data? Which license do you use? We wanted to know a lot of things. I'm not going to bore you with everything, but we also asked them if what, in their opinion, was the success factors for open data. Uh, and we are going to hold a, a workshop next week to discuss the challenges. Uh, the response rate of the survey was weird. Because the link was actually forwarded to so many other people, uh, in the end, um, when I got the data back, I got 577 responses. Uh, that is, you know, the software I used shows you how many people actually opened the survey, and that was 577. But only 43 were completed entirely. There were a lot of them, about 150 or so, that was where people started with the first four questions and then hooked off. So I didn't include them. Um, but, you know, when you look at it, it was mostly national mapping and cadastral agencies, a couple of local mapping and cadastral agencies, especially from Germany and from Spain. Uh, because they're a federated state, so we got them from the local states. A couple from municipalities also. Two clearing houses, both from Belgium. A um, couple of universities, a couple of private companies. The World Bank re responded, they're the NGO. And we had one anonymous entry who mainly used it to vent his spleen. Um, but if you look at the countries, as I said, it came from all over the place. This was not quite what we had intended, but this is what we got. So we had to exclude a couple of them. Um, but as I said, this is about the breakdown. Uh, Euro, Non-Euro SDR member national mapping agencies, or there were members. But the, the good thing was that about 15 out of the 18 national mapping and uh, uh, the NMCAs from Euro SDR responded. So from the Euro SDR, we got a really good response rate. The rest is benefit, bonus. Uh, in the end, to include, as I said, we only included completed forms. We only looked at European mapping, national mapping and cadastral agencies because that was what the original survey was about. So we excluded Canada and the United States. <coughs> Uh, we did include the clearing houses because they are a supplier of data, the geographical, uh, national, uh, of, of mapping and, and cadastral data. And we also included the two Irish public sector bodies who, because they supply land administration type data. And also because they gave some nice answers. Um, the first question we actually asked is, you know, in which year did your organization start to supply open data? Because we actually expected them that most of them would have only been started to do it in the last couple of years. But to our surprise, uh, about a third of them actually started before 2010, which is long before the digital agenda of, of Europe and the, the amended PSI directive. So what we suspect is that INSPIRE it was actually the biggest driver for open data for national mapping and cadastral agencies and not the digital agenda or the PSI amended directive. So that, that to me was a little bit of a surprise because I hadn't, you know, INSPIRE does have a bigger effect than I expected. Um, did a very quick breakdown of the organization because we asked them, you know, a breakdown, how many percent do you get from sale of data? How many percent do you get from compensation from the government? It's uh, in the, the report, it's nicely tabulated, but the table is unreadable. So I'm just giving you the gist. Um, yeah, about a third 
are actually financed for nearly 100%. One organization was financed for about 95% and now is fully financed after the introduction of open data. Uh, the other organizations, it's remained more or less stable. The, the, the amount of um, funding they uh, received before and after open data. And we looked at other sources of income they have, and as you can see, registration fees does account for quite a lot, and also fee-based data accounts for a fairly large percentage of other forms of income. This is after open data, by the way. Frederica, please let me just allow one question. Is Mrs. Varekumora in the room? If not, then we don't have our fourth presenter, which gives us a little more or less stress in time. Okay, I'll, I'll happily move along. Um, Open data funding, again, a lot of them receive compensation from the national government, so they are receiving money. Um, yeah, measures to take. And the, the thing that I find interesting about this one is that linked open data is coming in and they're also supplying tools to facilitate the reuse, and quite a lot of them are doing so. You see that they are starting to move down the uh, the value chain, and if you ask for the motivation for why open data, well, legal obligation is big, but also the economic growth and the societal benefits are big, and less so the uh, transparency. Feedback is also a big issue. They get more feedback due to open data, which they use for increasing the quality. Uh, it affects its head on the organization itself. Most of them had to employ extra server capacity, had to make extra costs, but they're also receiving more advice from other organizations to help them with implementing open data. So it works two ways. So if I look at the, the results, uh, open data, uh, Inspire appears to be the biggest dri driver of open data. All, nearly all of the national mapping agencies receive some form of extra funding from the central government. Um, and it's had little effect on the breakdown of their funding so far. Uh, and open data activities are still funded by sale of other data services and very much by internal efficiency gains. And if you look at the effects of open data, well, there was a need for extra infrastructural investments. There's loss of revenue, it's, you can't deny it, but there's also higher quality due to feedback. And they've had more requests for other data, for advice, etc. Efficient gains, gains are noticed. And you've, what you see is this shift of the role and the position that are actually moving towards the enabler, data enabler. If you want to read more, the article is online through the uh, uh, Journal of E-Democracy and Open Government. Um, future of open data. Open data is here to stay, even for self-funding agencies. It's the, 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 the agencies I talk to, the, especially the ones that have been supplying open data for a while, to them it's not an issue anymore. They're not going to go back. But what they have stressed over and over again is they need sustainable funding or co-funding. They need positive business cases to keep continuous political support. And they also stress that they need more cooperation between data suppliers among themselves, but also between data suppliers and between the users to make sure that what they offer is actually what the user wants. Demand and, and supply have to match. And, oh, did I mention funding? Um, Last slide, invitation. You are still welcome to attend our workshop if you want to. There's still a few seats available. You can, uh, these sheets will be available, but uh, you can enroll either see me or uh, send a mail to the secretaries. It's Monday and Tuesday. Monday and Tuesday morning, sorry. Thank you very much. Other questions? There are no? Yeah. Yes. Andrew. Frederica, uh, thanks for a very interesting presentation. Just one additional problem for the national mapping organizations 
when the funding is taken away is that you describe them moving into value-added services. Yep. Often, the private sector will turn around and say, and through them, the government, you're not allowed to go there. Yep. So, so uh, uh, they, they, they have some additional, uh, uh, additional problems. As you say, I mean, the main thing is the long-term sustainability of funding to replace the, the, the revenue. Yep. Um, and the problem there is that the, uh, in, after two or three years, you have a different government. Uh, they've forgotten that they actually made the commitment for the extra money, uh, and you're back into the same discussions about uh, um, the business case yep. overall in the economy rather than their local funding. Yep. So absolutely. sorry, it wasn't a question. It no, was no, 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 you're absolutely right. Um, and the, the issue about, uh, you know, what the market should do and what the, the uh, public sector should do, that is a very big issue and there have been complaints, there have been many complaints from private companies saying, you know, the government is actually sitting in their seat and the company should do it. But as we've also seen in Australia, the companies don't always do it. And then uh, government has two choices. Either they're going to sit and wait until someone gonna pick, picks it up or they're going to do it themselves. And what you need to do is find some sort of balance to, for, for government to maybe start doing, making the first step and then hoping that the private sector will step in. Uh, a company like Esri, has already stepped into the breach because they are now supplying, in the Netherlands at least, they are resupplying the national, the, the topographical map, one in 10,000 map, and also other data, but they're doing it in a more user-friendly format, and they're also enriching it with other data sets. So they are doing it, but building the data portals, I would love to see more public-private partnerships. But the problem with them is that you usually have contracts for them and then you exclude the young startups as well. So it's a, it's a very fine balance. And at this stage, it's going to be a case of, you know, sometimes you just have to make a start and then hope that the market will pick it up. But it's not a perfect market. That's the problem. It's an imperfect market. Um, I f thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Uh, a question which in the, in, the, in the course of the presentation came to me. Do you have examples where the provision of the, the generation and uh, publication of open data uh, is also a business case for private companies? So I said, is the, is the generation of data as a public good still a kind of monopole for public authorities which are later decided because there was there was the example by the Austrian Bureau of Statistics, which is actually very famous. Yeah. I heard of that before, where they uh, basically uh, made a stable business case out of that by by side business, by spin-off businesses. So, what examples are there as an incentive also to for producing and distributing data on a on a on a public public data open data basis also for private companies? I know actually um, uh, quite a number of small. Uh, private companies, developer type companies who've used open data as a, a way of, you know, develop a, a small tool, a small app, and then use that <coughs> as a, a showcase what they can do, and then they're being hired either by government <coughs> or by other uh, private companies to develop more tools. So it can serve as a um, sort of a calling card. Um, but apart from, it's the like, Open data is very often picked up by really large companies like the Googles, like the ESRIs of this world. Uh, and it's very difficult to then s see the, um, how should I put it, uh, see the added value be because it's being reused in their own products. And you as a consumer, you'll see it, but you don't notice it, if you know what I mean. It's because you don't know that in Google Maps, it's largely contains of, of public sector information. No one ever mentions it. They all think it's Google data, and it's not. Um, so pr what I've, f f in my research, I found that companies are using open data, but if they're using open data, quite often they don't mention it, or they're not even aware anymore of themselves that they're using it. And I also know private companies are also now supplying open data for the same reasons that governments are doing. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you.
and we move to the last speaker of this session. It's Dominique Laurent from the National Geographic Institute of France, and she will extend the box for perspective which is not just European. Uh, yes. Uh, I am not very gifted, sorry, without a mouse. Yes. Yes. Thanks. Okay. So it's a very different topic. It's some personal experience with a technical standard which is called LADM, uh, maybe not so quick, uh, the uh, Land Administration Domain Model Standard in and out of the inspire box. So first, uh, some basic concept about LADM, what it is. Uh, it's Land Administration Domain Model. It's an ISO standard, what was initiated by the FIG, International Federation of Surveyors, or Federation Internationale des Geomètres. The objectives were to facilitate data exchange, and I think it was mainly also to facilitate the implementation of land registration system in developing countries. What are the principles of land administration domain? It's the fact that a party, a person, a physical or legal person, has rights, responsibilities, or restrictions on a special unit, or more exactly, maybe on a set of uh, special units, such as, for instance, a, a set of flats or parking. Uh, persons, the party, the RRR, right, restriction, responsibility, and the special unit. They are really the three main pillars of this land administration domain model. Uh, very logically, uh, the standard includes five packages. There is one about very generic classes, such as version object or source to, for the documents, the party for the persons, the administrative package for the right, responsibility, and restriction, and two packages about geometry, special units, and surveying. So the first experience I had with land administration domain model was totally inside the Inspy box. It was when developing uh, the data specification for SIM cadastral parcel. Uh, in fact, the two standards uh, were uh, developed at the same time and influenced uh, quite a lot one another. Uh, and LADM, though it's called Land Administration Domain, it was design, designed mainly for the cadastral context. So a strong influence of these two standards. Uh, however, the context is uh, rather different. Uh, the geographic extent is not the same. LADM, as already explained, is for whole world. And maybe even more for developing countries, whereas in SPY, cadastral parcel is for Europe or even only political Europe. Uh, it's not also for the same data flow. Uh, the LADM standard is mainly for production. It's also for delivery, but it's mainly to facilitate the production of cadastral system, whereas in SPY is for delivery. And the scope also was not the same. Uh, of course, uh, the standard land administration domain model is for land registration system as a whole, whereas in SPY, it's the focus on geographic data is for the special data infrastructure. So there is this focus on the geographic part. So how have we done in the thematic working group? Uh, the idea was to make possible for a data producer to be compliant both with in SPY and with uh, the standard land administration domain model. So we have chosen a profile. On one hand, we are less demanding uh, than the standard because we focus only on the geographic component and it's uh, clearly written that rights and uh, owners are out of INSPY scope. On the other hand, INSPY on some topics may be more demanding than the standard, than the ISO standard. The ISO standard is very flexible. For instance, the geometric representation of a parcel may be a a surface, of course, it may be a solid and it may be a 3D object, but sometimes it may be just a point or even a textual description. In INSPIRE, we are more demanding, of course, it should be an area. 
It's in the definition in the directive areas defining cadastral register or equivalent. So it, it should be a surfacic representation. A second kind of experience, LADM totally outside the inspy box. Some African experience uh, that uh, were conducted uh, with IGN France International uh, in two projects. One was in Ethiopia. It was a project of adjudication of public land. And another one in Senegal, it was a project of digitalization of cadastral system. And in both cases, there was a small part of the work that was about designing the conceptual model uh, for the land registry database. And it should be based on the LADM standard. It was clearly stated, especially in Ethiopia. They were very willing to, to have something uh, based on this international standard. So the main learnings, uh, in a way, I was myself surprised it was very successful. The standard is really a very good basis to design the structure of the information system, uh, and especially uh, the package that is in the middle, the right responsibility and restriction, it's really very helpful uh, for my own work that was designing the conceptual model. And it's also very uh, helpful uh, to make the transition between conceptual model uh, to implementation. Uh, there were different people coming for making the implementation. We did, didn't have to time to make. They were coming from different countries. I think they went from Ukraine. And I was myself surprised. They understood the model very easily because it was based on this international standard. So it was really uh, making this transition from conceptual model to implementation very easy. Maybe some... Uh, all the learnings, of course, there is need for adaptation to national context. It's quite easy because LADM is flexible standard. It really offers a mean of being adapted. It was done through specialization, making more specific feature types, refinement of code list, fixing some options, for instance, for surveying. Uh, typically, uh, in the conceptual model, we have this kind of right that were coming from the standard, from the ISO standard. And of course, uh, it has to be adapted to the national models, uh, detailing more, which may be this different kind of rights that are, of course, depending on the countries. Of course, there is a, the lease, but for instance, old possession is very typical to Ethiopia. But there were some other adaptation to be done, for instance, adaptation to multilingual context, uh, as in Ethiopia, they have several languages, they even have several alphabets, and I will say the INSPIRE experience helped me quite a lot because we had to deal with this in, uh, in INSPIRE. And uh, there was also the will to add a package about valuation in Senegal, and I should say it was not so easy. I think there are some projects to revise the standard and the will to add a fiscal package, so I say the guys, good luck, because it's rather difficult. Some of the uh, thought about the standard, some possible improvement maybe for the standard itself, uh, for the party. Uh, in LADM, the party data was expected to come from external register, but it's not so sure it may work everywhere. Uh, sometimes these registers are poorly existing or they are not uh, so accessible because Internet is not working perfectly everywhere in Africa, for instance. And there is also the question of foreign owners. So are there other registers than the cadastral one uh, having these foreign owners? So uh, some, uh, some doubt about it. And also uh, the association that a party may represent another party may be missing. For instance, if there are minor children, they may be nevertheless owner of land and they need to be represented. Uh, there was also something about the role of notaries and surveyors. In the standard, uh, they are considered twice. Uh, they are considered as party, and they are also considered as attribute of the source, uh, of the document. And my feeling is it was not very efficient for implementation. There is some duplication of information. So for the two countries, we have decided to have spe specific feature types for this role of surveyors and uh, notaries and to link them only to the documents, not to consider them as party, at least for these 
two countries, they were not parties. They were just responsible for documentation. And in addition, uh, they don't have any right on the land, but they may have different rights in the information system. The parties, generally, the owners, they can just consult, they can just read. But the notaries and surveyors, sometimes they can write in the information system. So they really decide, uh, uh, deserve feature type by themselves. So it w w it's what was done. We have had the administrative body, because it's not only the notaries, but it may be the court and so on and the surveyor. And in addition, sometimes you need information about the company, uh, the surveyor cabinet, or, and sometimes about the personal employee. So it's some extension to the standard that maybe will deserve to be included in it. The last experience is LADM maybe back again to the inspire box. Uh, so it's uh, related to the work that I am doing on core data. Uh, it's in the context of UNGGIM, uh, United Nations Initiative on Global Geospatial Information Management. Uh, core data being the most useful to analyze, achieve, and monitor the SDG. Uh, in the first phase, in the working group, we selected some core themes, including land administration ones, not only cadastral parcel, but administrative units, protected site, area management, plan, land use. And in the second phase, uh, we are preparing recommendations for content, trying to identify what is the main information uh, to encourage the production of new data or the improvement of existing one. And this uh, work began by an analysis of the INSPIRE data model. Uh, to make this analysis, I have compared, uh, on one hand, the LADM standard and then the INSPIRE data specification, and the analysis was done according five uh, key questions. Where, when, what, who, and why. Uh, so the where, of course, in a way, it's the geometry. Uh, in uh, the standard, it's about the special unit and the surveying. Uh, there is some uh, assessment. Uh, what is very green, of course, it's when it's very good, you have everything in a good way. What is uh, not so green, you have key information, but maybe it's improvable. And what is orange is medium, not so good. It's a personal assessment. It uh, involves only my, uh, my assessment. So regarding the where, uh, we have information in both cases. Maybe LADM is a little complex, at least for the European context. But the information is there. The when, uh, the principles are almost the, the same in INSPIRE and, uh, and LADM. Maybe missing in some themes, but the idea is there. Uh, the what, in a way, it's related to this uh, right, responsibility, and restriction. And in some INSPIRE themes, it's documented, and in other one, not at all. And it's the same with the party who is responsible for doing things on, a, on an area. Uh, it's documented only in area management. And why it's a document? Uh, why are these people responsible or having right restriction on the land? Uh, it's the same. Uh, it's not documented everywhere. If we look maybe more in detail, uh, it's very heterogeneous in the scope. Uh, for instance, regarding cadastral parcel, uh, rights and party, uh, parties and rights, restrictions, responsibility are explicitly excluded. In administrative units, they are not even mentioned. And in protected site, land use, uh, area management, it's more or less taken into account. And the key issue is about the what. Uh, maybe when you say uh, cadastral parcel or administrative unit, you have something in mind about what is this what? You know that uh, cadastral parcel, it's mainly about ownership, typically, even if there may be details and uh, subtleties. Uh, in INSPIRE, we have some classification attributes regarding area management, protected site, land use. And there are also some attempts to really the model the content of the regulation text. For instance, there is an extended uh, schema about controlled activities. In the, pro in the area management, what is authorized, what is forbidden, what is obligatory, what should be managed, what are these things? What does it mean to be a protected site, for instance? 
what is this protection about? All this kind of thing, uh, they should, in a way, they are not always documented in an homogeneous way in INSPI. So I think there are uh, really user requirements, uh, especially regarding the SDG, uh, Sustainable Development Goal, to secure the land tenure and the land investment so people should be aware of their rights, so data about cadastral parcel, about the restriction, not only the private restrictions, the easement, that are least uh, related to the cadastral parcel or the cadastral system, but more and more about the restriction related to the public restriction. So all these inspired themes about protected site, land use, area management. And there is another strong need that is to ensure efficient and transparent governance, make people aware of the responsibility. Who, has, who is responsible for making what? Uh, it's on, uh, of course, administrative unit, but also in some area management. Uh, there are these managed areas. Some other learnings, uh, using the LADM standard in a way to better construct the system of information, uh, it's already ongoing in a specific domain. It's about the hydrographic, uh, hyd uh, International Hydrographic Organization. They have a new standard on maritime units, and they are using this LADM concept to model the maritime units and the rights, restrictions, responsibility applying on them. So it's already uh, going in the maritime unit. And we had also discussion about, uh, in the working group, about core geographic data, about what should be, in a way, all the regulations are core, but should all this information be geographic? And maybe the regulation text uh, should be documented more in documentary database with other text, not all only those related to geographic uh, information. Parties could be in a business register, including public bodies, and maybe limit the geographic data to the special units with just the geometry and key attributes. Uh, and there is a remaining issue, is the modeling of this right responsibility and restriction. Uh, I think now, in most cases, you have to read the text. And it may be very difficult for users uh, to have easy access to this information. It's not machine readable, as said by our uh, director of innovation during the plenary. So there are progress, possible progress on modeling really the content of this regulation text. Uh, I think the standard may supply the concept, the theory, but of course uh, there is a long way uh, from the theory to the practice. So the next potential steps, I think if there is a significant review of INSPI uh, implementing rule, this LADM concept might help to get a more harmonized view and maybe a simplified view on the data models related to this land administration themes. And making citizens aware of all these public restrictions and managed area is necessary, but it's a challenge. Of course, the first step is to make the inventory of all these regulated areas, the regulation text, as already promoted by INSPI, but maybe there is a second potential step will be to model the contents of the regulation text uh, in a way to go from raster data to vector data, even for the regulation text. Uh, this LADM concept and all the cadastral experience may help. For instance, even in cadastral, if you are based on deed, in practice, you have an information system with the right restriction uh, being uh, in the database and not only in the text. But of course, there is still a lot to do. And probably it's something that should be encouraged, maybe not in only by INSPI, but by other European initiatives. So uh, very uh, short conclusions. Uh, from all this experience, this standard was designed mainly for cadastral land registration context to with two main purposes, facilitate data exchange. There was some uh, experience with adaptation, I will say rather a minima for the INSPI cadastral parcel, 
to facilitate setting up cadastral system in developing countries. I had two personal successful experience in Africa, and I guess there were more, uh, at least because this Ukrainian guy <laughs> were very well <laughs> knowing the standards, so maybe they have, likely they have met with him uh, several times before. And land administration domain is not just about cadastre, but it's about land administration in general. And maybe it may help for upgrade some inspired sim that are related to land administration, administrative unit, protected site, area management, and land use. So many thanks for your attention. Merci, Dominique. Are there questions? Yes, one. Um, Dominic knows this, but Peter Parslow from Orton Survey in Great Britain. Um, so I'm going to say a few things that Dominic probably knows, but others may not, and then ask the question. So uh, the LADM standard is owned by ISO TC211, um, and they're aware of the fact that there's a lot of interest. You mentioned the marine community, um, interest in Africa and the UN and World Bank, kind of promoting that, and also. You, you've suggested ideas for extending it, and these other communities are also suggesting ideas for extension in terms of having standardized implementations rather than just conceptual standards and having validation, all sorts of things. Um, so the question really, are you aware that TC211 is looking for a project leader to coordinate all these extra extensions and requirements and um, may come up with a, a way to move forward across several standards bodies who want to be doing things with it um, and is IGN France interested? Uh, <laughs> I, I am aware of this uh, request, but uh, we don't volunteer. <laughs> But uh, there was a very positive effect uh, from making this presentation. It was that uh, I uh, uploaded uh, the ideas on the website of ISO, uh, the idea of the re maybe not request for change, but suggestion for change. It was an opportunity to, to upload them on the ISO uh, website. <laughs> it's a small step, but... <laughs> Dans quel campagne est-ce que vous avez déjà implémenté LADM? We have, we have not implemented it in France. And in the African countries, the idea was to implement it. Of course, I was not the implementer. I was just the conceptual model designer. My role stopped at the conceptual model.